Well, good morning. Good morning. Hope you're uh, doing well, enjoying the weekend so far. And I want to welcome those of you who are joining us right now from uh, one of our campuses or maybe online, wherever you happen to be in the world. Uh, we're glad that you're with us also. So uh, school's out. How many of you are happy uh, with that? Anybody? Or, I think it's out for most people. Or maybe it's not. Okay, maybe school's okay. <laughs> well, in order to uh, celebrate uh, school's out for my grandkids, uh, I decided to do a grandfather-granddaughter date, okay? We have seven uh, teenage, I limited it to teenagers, we have seven teenage granddaughters, uh, we wondered what this time would be like, you know, when they were born uh, several years ago. Uh, but it was great, and, but, but that was a little bit overwhelming. I, it sounded like, a, any, have you ever done something that sounded like a good idea? And um, then you went, how in the world are we going to pull this off? So I recruited grandma, who's kind of the queen of everything in our house. And um, uh, the girls thought we were going to go get something to eat and then maybe go have some quality time together at a park or something, you know. Grandma says, why don't you surprise them with a shopping trip? And so I did. And so here it is. So we took all seven of them downtown Charleston. We went to a reasonably priced store. If you own this store, it's a little advertising for you right now. But, uh, and then I gave them a, a, a limit, right? I gave them 45 minutes and a limited amount of resources. And uh, we fudged on the resources. I'm going to tell you that. They did pretty good. But uh, we had a great time. And it made for a great picture. I mean, I put this on Instagram, you know, as a highlight reel. And, and uh, uh, you know, it, it just made, made a great picture. Now, how many of you know that not every family picture is that great? You familiar with that? You know, we don't put them up when, you know, uh, we were arguing and cussing at one another. And this is kind of what it looked like. You know, we don't, we don't do that on social media. Uh, some of them are really awkward. I, I went through and I found some awkward family pictures. Have you seen any of these? Like this one, I don't know what they were thinking. Um, I think it was his idea. But it's Memorial Day, actually, and they were going to the Indy 500. So that's what that was about. Not, not a good idea. This one I thought was interesting. Because do, do you ever try to figure out, I don't know these people. I'm sorry if you're here or, or you know them, but... This had to be dad's idea because he's the only, he's like lit up. It's kind of goofy dad, right? Hey, let's open our mouths and let's, you know, just smile as much. And mom's going along with it, but she kind of likes it, I think. She's really into it. And the brother is like, wow, that's not what I want to do. <laughs> now, this one, dad's a little bit different. Dad's kind of, he's barely there, right? Mom's idea. And junior here's got about one digit right up the nose. <laughs> and, uh, how many of you have ever done a family picture where you uh, didn't want to pay a photographer, so you put it on a timer? Have you done that? It, sometimes it can happen like this. I mean, she's running like crazy, <laughs> but it's not working all that well. Here's one just for nostalgia. This is one of my family pictures. This is my dad, my mother. Dad's just getting ready to go on the road as an evangelist. He did that quite a bit in his life, and so this was kind of a cover picture for an album he did. My sister, my, my brother, what unfortunate choice. You ever look back and go, what were we thinking when we were wearing that stuff? My youngest brother, Chris, who I barely knew, and here's your rock star wannabe pastor during those, during those years. Yeah, right, right. But here's the deal. Here's the deal. Um, relationships can be challenging. Would you agree with that? Do you agree with that? There were times at Seacoast, I've told you guys this before, um, we have a great family picture right now. The one I posted I thought was fun, and this is a good time for our, our family. But um, uh, families are kind of like photo albums, and you have family pictures at various points, and some of them are good, some of them are not. There were times in the, in the growth of this church where we would have a, rela a family relationship series on the, on the books and I would just kind of strike through that and say, no, nah, it's not going so hot for us. I'm not going to get up and tell everybody else how to do it. It just goes that way. Relationships are tough. Um, families, I have multiple friends right now who have family members that aren't speaking to them or their family is divided. So if you can relate to that. Um, often it's about politics or faith. And it's just, it's a really, really hard 
sad time. I have friends that have the same thing going on. I was talking to a guy just the other day and he said, you know, I have a guy that was, we, we were so close and a best man in wedding and all that kind of stuff, won't even talk to me anymore. I'm just divide it. You know, it, it happens with our coworkers, you see it. It happens in churches. Um, I, obviously, you guys know, if you come here to Seacoast, that, that I spend most of my time at a retreat center here in town for pastors. Over 1,800 have come now, and you guys support that. That's awesome. And, you know, we see amazing things happen. But one of the common themes uh, is, that, is that, you know, um, church hurt. For, and we, we hear it from congregational people. And so if you've been hurt by churches, we hear it from pastors. And oftentimes the, the, what I'm hearing about since we started three years ago is, uh, Greg, there's an election coming and it just tore our church up, you know, uh, four years ago. How do we handle it? We have people that won't talk to each other or, you know, longtime friends that have left. How do you handle that? Relationships are difficult. Whole denominations, you can read it, you know, denominations are splitting or on the verge of splitting. Difficult, our country, we kind of know uh, how polarized that we are. And here's my question, why can't we just all get along? Huh, would you agree with that? Why can't we just all get along? Well, fortunately, the Bible has something to say about that. In fact, in James chapter four and verse one, it asks that question. What causes fights and quarrels among you? Why can't we just all get along? And then he answers it. Don't they come, what, the fights and quarrels, from your desires that battle within you? How many of you would agree with me that desire is not necessarily a bad thing? God created us with desires. There are just desires that are not helpful. Desires maybe to be first. And he talks about that in the scripture. We have a desire. I want, I want to be preeminent. I want to be first. And you know, to have ambition is not a bad thing. It's selfish ambition. How does this impact everybody else? I want to be first. Uh, I want more, a desire for more. And so it gets even worse if I see you with more, you prospering, you doing well, I don't see myself doing as well. And so that stirs up emotions internally at first and then uh, externally with some attitudes and then we've got, a, we've got a division going on. I have a desire to be seen. I have a desire to be heard. I don't feel like you're seeing me. I don't feel like you're hearing my side of the whole thing and we could go inside of ourselves and it's crazy and then suddenly we've got divided families, divided churches, divided friends to be in control to be in control, the desire to be in control. Any, anybody here have that desire at all? I mean, I, I've got a little bit of that that I have to battle with, okay? And it divides people, okay? So friends are offended, families don't speak, workplaces are divided, politics are polarized, and churches are split. Now, here's what I think. There's got to be a better way. Would you agree with that? I believe that there is a better way. In fact, in Ephesians, and I'm going to talk to you from Ephesians 4, because that's something I've been meditating on for a couple, three years. But in the book of Ephesians, Paul basically says two things. He says, let's grow up in Christ, all right? Let's, let's grow up and let's get along with one another. And he gives a lot of instruction and a lot of scripture about how to do that. And so today, here's what I want to do. I'm going to look at Ephesians 4, 1 through 4, some of the principles I've talked about before because I've been meditating on them, but I've got one at the end that I really, really want you to see, and I've got a tool uh, that I, that I want to give you. In fact, I'm, I'm hoping, and I'll tell you a little bit more, more about that in a minute, that outside of our time together, that you'll spend some time maybe with your family or maybe in your workplace, maybe in your small group, talking about how can we apply this because it's so very, very important. So I want to talk to you about what it means to be a Christian and how we can improve relationships with one another. You ready for that? All right, here we go. Ephesians chapter four and verse one says this. As a, why don't we read this out loud? As a prisoner for the Lord, then, I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling that you have received. A couple of things about this. He says, I urge you. That means it's what? It's important, right? 
It's important. He says, I urge you. I, I, I want you to hear that I'm an apostle. I'm in prison. This is so very, very important. It was important to the people that he wrote it to, the people in Ephesus, which, by the way, was a pretty diverse city. It was a city somewhat like Charleston. It was a coastal city. People went there for holidays, like the one that we have right now. People also went there for entertainment, and they went there for commerce, all right? And uh, there's Jewish people in the church. There's Greek people in the church, because the Greeks had, you know, basically dominated the world for a little while. Then the Romans took over, so there's Romans in the church. Very diverse. And he says, listen, it's so important for the cause of Christ going forward. And I want you to look at this message from that point of view. It's not even necessarily about today. It's about going forward, going forward. It's the people that follow. It's the world that desperately needs what we need to be living. And he says, I urge you to live a life according to what? Worthy of your calling. So here's the question, what's your calling? What's your calling? I have people down through the years that have said to me, I don't know what my calling is. What if I go through my whole life and don't know why? Who was it? Mark Twain that said uh, two most important days in your life, the day you were born and the day you figure out why, right? And people go, I don't know what my call, I don't know what I'm called to be. I'm going to settle that for you right now. It's so exciting, okay? Here's what you're called to be. If you're a follower of Christ, you're called to be a believer. You're called to be a Christian, okay? That is your calling. You're called to bring the kingdom rule of God, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, long-suffering, all of those things. You're called to bring that into every environment you go into. You went to, you went to Starbucks this morning, I can tell. No, that's our coffee probably. Eh, whatever. Ours is better. But if you went to, so even, even ours, if, if you went to Starbucks or went to our coffee shop and wherever you happen to be in one of our campuses, in that moment that you interacted with, with that barista, I went uh, to a coffee shop earlier this week and I thought it'd be right in, right out. Are you ever like, you time it where you don't have much time? I'm going right in, right out. I'm speaking somewhere and I go right in, right out and it wasn't right out. And I could tell that barista was kind of, and I'm, I'm going like this and, 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 and I'm thinking, you know what? I'm not living according to my calling because I'm bringing chaos into this situation. I'm not bringing the love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness of Christ. And so I kind of settled myself. And I thought, my goal is to live according to my calling. And I'm going to make, I'm going to add value to this barista rather than make her life more difficult. Because she's overwhelmed. You understand what I'm saying? Yeah. We, 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 we come into a room, we're not a thermos thermometer where we kind of just, Here's the temperature, and I, I'm like that. We're a thermostat. We set the temperature of the room. So that's what it means. As a prisoner of the Lord, I urge you to live a life worthy of being a believer, worthy of being a Christian, worthy. So, so you're going to bring the kingdom rule of God into every environment that you're in. That's what he's saying. Now, how do you live your life? worthy of the calling that you have received. I am so glad that you guys asked that. Here we go. All right, three things. I'm gonna barely touch on two, and the third one I'm really excited about giving you a tool that I think will help you in this. Here's the first one, and, and I call it how to act like a Christian, all right? How to act, how, how have you think, just by the way, how do you think more Christians need to know how to act like a Christian? Anybody? Yeah. I, I think the thing that our world needs right now is a more accurate reflection of Jesus. Okay? And so that, that's what we're going to try to help, help, help you with here. So in verse 2, he says, verse 1, he says, act worthy of your calling. Verse 2, he says, be completely, say completely together. That means completely. <laughs> be completely humble and gentle. And here's the principle. Be totally committed to personal humility. What if we had a whole world full of Christians who were personally committed, or who were radically, totally committed to personal humility? You think that would help things? Three of you think that would help things. I'm gonna, I'm gonna talk to the campuses in a minute. How many of you think that if we were totally committed 
The personal humility, it would help relationships. Anybody believe that? Yes. Okay. All right. Look what the Bible says in Philippians 4. He says, do nothing. Say nothing together. Nothing. It means nothing. Okay. <laughs> do nothing out of selfish ambition. I mentioned earlier, it's okay to be ambitious. I'm ambitious. I want to be ambitious. But there's a difference between ambition, godly ambition, and selfish ambition, which doesn't care about the people around us. How's this going to impact everybody? Well, I don't care. I just, I want it. Okay. It says, do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves, not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interest of others. Okay. That's the pattern. That's the pattern. How you doing? How you doing? Look, here's the phrase that pays. Billy Hornsby taught me this years ago. You might be right. It's the phrase that pays. I, I use it all the time when I think I'm right and you're wrong. <laughs> You've heard me say at Seacoast before. You don't have to agree with me on everything. You have a right to be wrong. Okay, that's just kind of <laughs> how it is. And I say that funny because that's kind of how we live. It's, you, you know, you have your, but in my mind, I'm right. And every, every time I come into one of these potential conflict situations, Billy Hornsby, God rest his soul, comes to my mind when he taught me, Greg, learn this phrase, you might be right. Because the first time you say it, you know good and well they're not right. <laughs> You're right. I'm right, I'm right. But if you practice it and you practice it and you practice it, you don't have to agree with them. You just have to maintain this idea that there is a slight glimmer of a chance <laughs> that they may have some insight on this. That's the, you know what that is? That's the beginning of humility. And I would, I would posit today that we need personal humility Churches need, especially denominations, need theological humility, and our, our country could use some political humility, okay? And then, and then maybe we'd get along with each other a little bit better, all right? You might be right. All right, so you, you go, I don't know, if, I don't know anybody, I don't, I don't know anybody completely humble and gentle, I don't know if I want to be. All right, here we go. This is for you. The reward, say reward together. For humility and fear of the Lord is riches, honor, and life. Quick quiz. How many of you could use more money? How many of you could use more honor? How many of you could use a better life? Eh, eh? Jesus said, I've come that you might have life and life more abundantly. He's not talking about money necessarily there. This one kind of is. It says that there is a reward for humility. And fear of the Lord, which is riches, honor, and life. So there's a, there's a reward in it. And so be completely humble and gentle. Let's make that a part of our personal goal. Now, how to act like a Christian, the second thing is be patient, bearing with one another in love. Bearing with comes from the Greek word for putting up with. Do you know anybody who's difficult to put up with? Don't point. Okay. It's what this is saying right here. It's saying, be patient, putting up with one another in love. It's easy for me to put up with people just like me, right? Well, this isn't talking about that as much. It's talking about the people that require patience and you got to put up with. And here, here's what that means. Make allowances for the process in others. How of you would say that you're a work in process? Yep. Yep. Turn to the person next to you and say, you are a work in process. <laughs> yeah, okay. All right, that's enough. Would you agree with me on this? Would you agree that we tend to judge others by their actions and we want to be judged by our intentions. Would you agree with that? Somebody acts a certain way and you jump immediately to judging what their intentions are. 
They're rude. They're crude. They don't care. You know, all this kind of stuff, right? But if it's me and my actions don't meet the mark, I just want you to know I didn't mean it that way. I, this is my, I, I intended to be that, right? Right? Well, that, that's what this is talking about. This is saying, let's reverse that a little bit. Well, we don't have to reverse it. You can do that with yourself. But let's do, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. And when you see an action that just really grinds you in the wrong way rather than jumping to judging motives, which by the way, I was reading a scripture in Proverbs the other day that says you can't even judge your own motives. God's the only one that knows. That you, that you, that, that you lighten up, lighten up, lighten up. Okay, the phrase that pays is this. God isn't finished with them yet, right? It might be one of your kids. It might be a coworker that's difficult to get along with. He says, and I am sure of this, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. I can only imagine Paul writing this to Philippians. He's probably thinking about somebody that's a real knucklehead. That he's, that he's having to love by faith. Is there anybody that you have to love by faith from time to time? And he's trying to, he's trying to believe the best and all this. He says, okay, here, here's the deal. I'm gonna say this out loud. And I'm sure of this, at least I'm pretty sure that he who began a good work in you. I don't have to worry about it, all right? all right? So, how to act like a Christian. First of all, completely humble and gentle, bearing with one another. And here's the third one. I want to take a little time. Make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. Make every effort. And here's the phrase. Keep your focus on the right things. Keep your Focus, it's so easy to get our focus on things that don't matter. Gotta focus on just a few things. In fact, I would say like this, there, there are a few things that you need to be close-minded about. And there are a whole bunch of things that you need to be open-minded about. And keep your focus on what is really, really important. And here it is, next verse, he tells us what we focus on. There is one body, one spirit, just as you were called to one hope when you were called, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God, one Father of us all who is over all and through all in all. What's that saying? The focus is on one thing, the unity of the body of Christ. That's what he just said in the verse before, and he's telling you about how that works because there's only one God, one baptism, one faith. We see things different. Now, now this is what's interesting. This verse, I hadn't seen it like this before this week. I was meditating on it. The problem is, but, have you know, big butts are a problem. And this is a big butt. But to each one, that's you, that's me, to each one of us, grace has been given as Christ apportioned it. Now, I've always seen that as a positive, and I think it is. What is grace? Grace is the ability. God, God has given you the ability. He's given you gifts. He's given you favor in certain areas. God has given us all that, and I'm thankful for that. But the problem is, is that grace has been given as Christ apportioned it. In other words, in other words, this. Unity would be so much easier if everyone was more like me. <laughs> Follow what I'm saying? Grace, but unity. Everybody's different. Everybody has different opportunities, different gifts, different graces. And he says, what I want you to do is I want you to get along and I want you to focus on what's important, and that's the unity of the Spirit. The phrase that pays is unity builds bridges while disunity creates divides. If you're in unity, and I'm not talking uniformity right now, there's a whole difference in that. Uniformity says everybody has to look the same, talk the same, believe exactly the same, all of that. No, that's not what we're talking about. We're talking about the unity, and I'm gonna show you how you figure that out. But the unity of the faith. If you're in unity, you're building bridges. If you're in disunity right now, you're creating divides. In the church, at home, in the workplace, school, wherever it happens to be. Now, I'm gonna talk you about three buckets. I'm so excited about this, and I don't have a lot of time, but at the time, we're, oh my goodness, how did I do that? We have five minutes remaining. We gotta go. We gotta go. We gotta go. All right. This applies to individuals. It applies to families. It applies to 
businesses, sports teams, applies to churches. I'd love to take all of those. I'm going to do just basically individuals and churches. But it's three buckets, all right? And let me talk to you about the three buckets. I'm going to look at these two. I'm going to choose one of these for this, essentials. You got a big bucket of essentials, and you got a, perhaps a little bucket. And I'm going, to, I'm going to choose one of them. But what are essentials? Essentials are core principles. They are non-negotiable, and they shape identity values and practices. Family, church, business, whatever it is. Essentials. This is who we are. This is the important stuff, all right? And here's what uh, the Bible says about essentials. Amos says, can two people walk together without agreeing on the direction? What's the answer to that? No. If I'm going west, you're going east, we aren't walking together, okay? There are essentials. Now, um, I would suggest you can pick one of these two buckets. You can pick a big bucket of essentials, which means you have a whole lot of them in there. Just a lot of things that we have to agree on if we walk together. Now, if that is the case... Here's what I can say about your organization, church, business, whatever. It's probably going to be smaller, which is okay. I'm just telling you, just to look at this. Uh, because why is it smaller? Because there's a lot of things we got to agree on, right? Okay. It's probably going to be cleaner because we agree on a lot of things. Um, you may tend toward legalism. I'm not saying you are legalistic, but there's a lot of rules to keep, and that's the temptation. Now, if you switch the over here to the smaller bucket. Here's what I know about your organization. It could be bigger. It's one of the reasons that Seacoast has grown like it should, or like it, like it has over the last several years. There are a lot of reasons for it, but one of them, we were, we've been very intentional about keeping this bucket real small, okay? Real small. And the smaller the bucket, the more people, you know, probably can, can well, it's going to be messier though. I can testify to that, okay? It's going to be messier. Um, and the, the temptation is going to be toward conviction creep. In other words, as a leader, what I've had to do all, all our time here is protect this bucket of essentials because I have convictions that aren't in the essentials and people have convictions that aren't in the essentials and they want to put them in there. And so it's conviction creep, all right? So let's, let's, let, me, let me show you a couple of things. What are the essentials? This is a family. Our personal essentials might be things like integrity. I, we don't tell lies. Humility, we talked about that. Respect, we want to respect everybody. Responsibility, we all take responsibility for ourselves. Faith, you can put anything you want to in there, but think about it. What is in, that's something I love you to discuss at some point. What's in your personal bucket? What's in your family bucket of essentials? That These are absolutes, all right? Now, um, for a church, it's, we don't get to choose what's in the bucket. It's been chosen for us a long time ago. Early church fathers, and there's a lot of reasons for this, love to teach this. I have two minutes to teach it, so I won't. But um, wh why, they, why they did this, but it says, I believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. Um, he descended to hell. The third day he rose again from the dead, uh, he ascended to heaven and is seated at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From there, he will come to judge the living and the dead. There's so much in that. That's what we believe. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church. That just means the universal church, the communion of the saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Some of you came from a church where you stood and read that every week, right? That's the Apostles' Creed. That's our essentials. That's what belongs in that bucket for a church, all right? We don't, we don't get a choice. You're a little bit early. <laughs> give me just a minute, all right? Actually, I'm late. You're fine, uh, but give me just a minute, all right? I'm going to do five minutes, and we'll shorten it for the next service. All right, so... So let's talk about the big bucket then, the, the, the non-essentials. And there are two things in them. There are convictions and preferences. Let's go through. Like for individuals or families, it might be a political affiliation. You know, you're, you have strong conviction on that. Environmental practices. Some of you, you know, you recycle. Some of you can't spell recycle. Some of you are like me and you cannot for the life of you remember what should be in the recycle bucket, Okay. Uh, health and fitness might be a strong conviction of yours. Education methods, you know, homeschool, public school, whatever it is. Uh, cultural issues, and there's lots of those. Uh, parenting styles, and 
Families fight over that all the time. Convictions. I have strong convictions about those things. We can argue about them well, not destroying one another, but they're not in my essential bucket, all right? Preferences. Sports teams, hobbies, fashion, music, movies, iPhone versus Android. I love you if you're my friend, but I hate the green thing that comes in messaging. Okay, but we can, whatever, okay. All right, let's go to churches. Let's go to churches. Mode of baptism. Do you dunk, sprinkle? Do you hold them all the way under a long, long enough? What do you say? I baptize you in Jesus' name only. I baptize you in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Convictions. Different churches do it different ways. Communion. Um, intinction, which is what we do, dip it. Um, transubstantiation, Catholic. It is the body of Christ. All kinds of different things, okay? Church governance, Presbyterian type. We've got elders. Congregational type, you're Baptist. You know, um, all kinds of different ways, all right? And every one of them think they're right. Spiritual gifts, how do we use them? I came from a Pentecostal church. Certain ways that you do all that. Uh, women's role in ministry. Baptists are splitting right now over this. Should women be able to preach, teach, or whatever? All right. Uh, end times. When's Jesus coming? We don't know. All right. So preferences. That's just, I'm there. All right. But there are some people that think they know. All right. Preferences. <laughs> Worship styles. All right. You know what that is. Churches split over that. You shouldn't. Architecture. You know, how is it? Dress codes. Music styles, all kinds of stuff. Preaching style, how long is this service, all right? So those are... <laughs> Stop it, I've got to, I'm over by a minute and a half, come on. Why do we do that, by the way? Why, why does it matter? Because we have three services and we got it one hour to do it in and they're gonna cut the worship back just a little bit and we'll be fine. So what do you do about these what do you do about these? Romans 14, accept the one whose faith is weak without quarreling or over disputable matters. What are disputable matters? The Apostles' Creed? No. That's absolute. Everything on this board and a lot of other things you can think about are disputable matters. What does he say? Don't quarrel over them. How do you do that? Accept him whose faith is weak. Whose faith is weak? The other guy. Your faith is strong, okay? That's a whole message too. Then he goes on, you then, why do you judge your brothers or sisters? Good question. Or why do you treat them with contempt? For we all stand before God's judgment seat. He's talking about a church. They're arguing because... Some of them are Jewish and they're keeping Jewish law, Jewish food laws and Jewish holidays. Others are, are uh, Gentiles. They don't have a clue about any of that stuff. And they're fighting over it. And he says, don't fight, don't fight. Different issues, same stuff today. Therefore, let us stop passing judgment on one another. Instead, make up your mind not to put any stumbling block or obstacle in the way of a brother or a sister. All right? So that's what he says about non-essentials. Now, Real quick, let me give you my third bucket. This is where it makes sense. This is where it makes sense. What's, what's in the third bucket? The third bucket is what I call organizational essentials. All right, let me put it like this. This campus, whatever city you're in, any campus anywhere, you drove by several churches today. You drove by Baptist church, you drove by a Methodist church, you drove by a Presbyterian church, a non-denominational church, AME church. You drove by several churches and you came here. Now, they all believe different things in what I call the non-essentials. Who's right? Ooh, it got quiet. Here's what, here's what happens. I, I would say, for the most part, they all are. What organizational essentials are is when you take, like for a church, you take everything in the essentials bucket and you dump it into this one. Everything. And then you take a few things from the non-essentials that you feel really strong about. Women in ministry, governance style, how, for, take those two, right here you got a Baptist church for the most part, all right? 
Or you take all of this, dump it in here. Another view on women in ministry, um, a view on the gifts of the Holy Spirit, how it's used, what baptism of the Holy Spirit means. You got a Pentecostal church, all right? You can mix them all up every which direction. That's okay. I think it's okay with the business. You have to go, here are our core beliefs and here are a couple of things you got to do in order for, I think it's okay for a family. Here's where the problem is. You're going to see it real quick. When (laughs) they put a tag on and says, we do it right. It's like this. This is Lowe's. We're advertising Lowe's today. Back in the bucket. Do it right. Now they don't say we do it right or Home Depot would have a problem with that. All right. But when, when we say we're the only ones who do it right, you got a problem. I heard a joke. Can I tell a joke real quick? Guy dies, goes to heaven. St. Peter meets him at the gate, you know, shows him around. And uh, they go to this one area and it's real loud, noisy. They're worshiping. Brandon Lake's leading worship, you know, all this kind of stuff. It says, uh, says uh, who's that? I said, well, that's the Pentecostals, Charismatics. They, they worship. Great. Go to another area. And uh, man, they got Sunday school and it's organized. I said, here's with the Baptists. So now you're gonna have to be real quiet when we go into the next area. So why do we have to be quiet? They say, well, they think they're the only ones here. They do it right. They think they're the only ones here. And (laughs) that wasn't very good telling, but I'm doing it quick. (laughs) Some of you grew up in a church like that. We're the only ones that do it right. Well, see, when you do that, you're calling everybody else heretics. And you're dividing the body of Christ. Okay? Families. Businesses, same thing. It's all right to have your organizational bucket, but when you move from you might be right to we do it right, then you're dividing the body of Christ and you're dividing the family. Does that make sense? That was worth waiting for the whole time. In essentials, we have unity. In non-essentials, we have liberty. In all things, we have charity. I didn't make that up, but I agree with it. Here's the deal. We must get this right. Because the enemy of the church is working overtime to divide and conquer. You just watch in the next few months. You just watch. I'm preparing you for what's happening. All right? We're not going to go for it. We're not going to go for it. We're going to keep humble. You can play now. (laughs) We're going to keep humble. Right? Right? We're going to bear with people who don't agree with us on stuff. And we're going to keep the focus on the main thing and the right thing. And that's the unity of the body of Christ. And there's the scripture, and I don't have time to read it. But here you go. Key questions for response time. Are you a Christian? Am I a Christian? Do I believe that God is who, that God, that there is a God? That he created the heavens and the earth. Do I believe that Jesus Christ is the son of God, born of a virgin, died, buried, rose again, sits forever, having intercession with the Father for you, and is coming again that we might have eternal life. The Holy Spirit is at work in the church. You don't have to understand all of it, but you got to agree with it. By the way, if I want to start a new church, And I say, I like most of the Apostles' Creed, but not all of it. I can call it a church, but it's not Christian. Because that's absolute. And I need to ask, am I a Christian? Second thing, am I living according to my calling? Am I completely humble and gentle or prideful and harsh? Am I making allowance for the process in others or canceling people who aren't like me? Am I focusing my efforts on the unity of the faith or am I dividing the body of Christ? Let's pray. Father, I thank you today for your grace, your goodness to us. God, I ask that your kingdom would come during our response time right now. God, that you would make it very, very clear in our hearts where we are. Lord, lead us to a a place of repentance. We want to be gentle and humble. We want to be accepting of our others, and we want to focus on what's important. God, I pray that your kingdom would come, your will would be done. In Jesus' name we pray.
Amen. Amen. Amen.